It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 305 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 29th of July, 2018. I'm Ed Brown and joining me today is Penny Dumsday. Hi. A high school biology teacher with a background in evolutionary biology. Welcome back, Sarah DeGarris. Hello. And an astronomer and astrobiologist at the University of Southern Queensland. Good to have you back, Professor John T. Horner. Good evening. And before we go any further, I just want to remind everyone to go to scienceontop.com slash donate and throw some money at us on Patreon. Doesn't have to be a lot, although a lot is preferred, but it all helps us pay the bills so we don't have to keep reaching into our own pockets too much and going bankrupt and mortgaging the house. So... Today, we're going to be talking about finding liquid water on Mars, a new species of peacock spider found. We'll look at how viruses team up to defeat bacteria and how CRISPR gene editing has removed genetic diseases from mice. So there's been a lot happening in astronomy news of late. We talked last week about the new moons discovered around Jupiter. Yesterday morning, most people in the Southern Hemisphere got a chance to see the longest lunar eclipse since the year 2000. Anyone get up early to see it? I did not. I was actually awake at four and I was like, ugh. You know, (laughs) you just randomly wake up. I was like, I should stay up and watch the eclipse. And I thought, no. There'll be a clear I wish all children wake up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the puppies tried to wake me up, but I resisted. Uh, I do like lunar eclipses because they have the huge advantage of lasting a lot longer than solar eclipses. Uh, and it's just really cool to see a red moon and that sort of thing. But I've seen one this year already at the start of the year, which was amazing. And that was at a reasonable hour of like 11.30, 12 o'clock. I wasn't going to get up at 5.30 uh, this morning or yesterday morning. It was cold. And it, well, I'm in Melbourne. It was probably covered in clouds. I'm, I'm kind of the same. But one of the things I always think is really cool when you see the lunar eclipses is, is the way each one's different. You know, some are a lot darker, some are a lot redder, some are a lot brighter. And it's kind of, you're seeing a sample of the weather forecast from the entire rim of the Earth (laughs) all at once. So when it's a particularly cloudy eclipse, it's darker. When there's a lot of fires going on and stuff, it's redder. Mm -hmm. People are actually doing research using the moon to model the Earth's atmosphere, looking at the colour of the eclipse. It's really kind of cool. It is. I love that there's actual science that we can get from it. And as you say, that reddish colour is actually from the distortion of the light from the Earth's atmosphere as uh, the light gets to you. So it's very, very cool. But the really big astronomy news was announced on Thursday when some Italian researchers published a paper in the journal Science titled Radar Evidence of Subglacial Liquid Water on Mars. Jonti, it's not often that paper titles are that clear and straightforward, but what they found is exactly that. Evidence of a lake of liquid water beneath the surface of Mars. That's very cool. Oh, it is. For me, it's... I'm really excited about it. I'd probably badge it as one of the biggest discoveries of the last 20 years. Wow. In the whole of, ast- whole of astronomy, not just, plan- just, not just planetary science or anything else, but the whole of astronomy, I think this is one of the big ones. But then I'm biased. I'm an <laughs> astrobiologist, so I'm kind of going to be excited by this. Well, and right there is the big draw card is where there's water, on Earth at least, there's life. And so this could suggest a chance of life in Mars, not on Mars because it's underneath the surface. (laughs) That's kind of the hope. I mean, this sets kind of the five-year-old jaunty that still lives inside me running around and doing (laughs) backflips with excitement is such a thrilling result. And I guess the context is that on Earth, we've got exactly the same kind of features below Antarctica. There's more than... 400 lakes buried beneath the ice sheet down at minus 60 degrees just like the conditions here would be really briny really slushy and people have found life in them so if that's true there why not on mars yeah it's kind of a cool result yeah we've talked on the show before about the russian team that's drilled into lake vostok uh, one of the world's largest lakes which is in antarctica um how big is this lake that we're talking about the one on mars let's get a, a dimensions for it 
we don't have all the dimensions in yet. So the way that the detector works is it scans a strip of Mars every time it goes above. Basically, it's bouncing radar waves down onto the surface and back up. So what we can say is that the lake is about 20 kilometers across in one direction, but we don't know if it's circular or elongated. And we don't know whether the water is 100 meters deep or 10 kilometers deep or 50 centimeters deep, as far as I can tell from the paper. Okay, so there's a lot of unknowns. <laughs> there is, but this is what it's like when you're trying to sample something that's a kilometre and a half down under the surface of a different planet. If it was easy, we'd have done it already and it wouldn't be interesting. <laughs> well, we wouldn't have known it was there until just recently. Um, Absolutely. I mean, part of what gives you confidence with this one, though, is the fact that they didn't just observe it once. They were really rigorous and they went back time and time again as the spacecraft passed overhead. They've got observations all the way through from early 2012 through to the end of 2015. So that's oh, wow. pretty much four years of continuous observations. Then they've spent the last three years before publishing, making absolutely certain that there's nothing else this could be. So it's one of those ca you often see people rush things through to publication because they're really mm. cool keen it's a dead exciting result all the rest of it here they've really done their due diligence and they've checked everything out and yeah that just makes you a bit more confident that what they think they've seen is actually there that is kind of unusual as well to have a project go for so many years and not be published straight away because often you'd be worried that another team has also noticed what you're seeing and they're going to scoop you and publish it and get all the attention and credit uh, but good on them for sticking to it. I guess it's probably one of the advantages of it being a European rather than NASA mission. So with all of the missions NASA sent to the planets in the solar system, all the data is live straight away. It's all publicly available straight away. And that's part uh, of NASA's charter. We'll share everything with everyone because that's why we're funded. Yeah. With the European stuff, it stays under embargo much longer, which means the scientists that are on the team who are getting the data have a lot longer to actually do things right like this without fear of getting scoops. I suspect, much I hadn't thought of it till you said that, that's probably a big part of this, is that they've had the embargo there, so they knew they weren't going to get scoops, so they have the time to really be as thorough as they possibly can be. Very cool. And we were talking about the chance of life and everything, but you also said this is salty brine-like water. So... The, the, it's, if anything is there, it's going to be an extremophile that can withstand very hardy uh, situations, isn't it? Yes, and no. I mean, I've I've seen some really interesting discussions uh, at some of the astrobiology conferences about what being an extremophile actually means. And typically, when people say extremophile, they just mean something that lives in conditions that we couldn't, you know, in conditions that are very different to the ones we're used to, almost. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I know it's a bit more complex than that, but to something that is adapted to those conditions, we're the extremophile. If you take bacteria from Lake Williams under the Antarctic, it would consider as an extremophile we live at such high temperatures, such low pressures, because we're in atmosphere rather than water, mm -hmm. that I think extremophile is one of these terms which is very dependent on where you're standing and where you're looking. That said, I do take the point, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is not going to be lifelike the stuff you get growing in the kettle if you leave it too long before you clean it. <laughs> Yeah. It is going to be something a bit different. It's not going to be a Martian Aquaman. That's, I think, what everyone's really saying. <laughs> yeah, that seems unlikely. I mean, I think, yes, it would be lovely to think that there are dolphins doing backflips down there, but that isn't going to be the case. If there is life down there, it's going to be microscopic life, single-celled life, stuff that can survive in those conditions and thrive. And when we say that it's salty, we know that not because we've done any test or measurement but in order for it to be liquid in that low pressure environment it would have to be high in salt is that right yeah that's the thinking so you've got two things there that are helping the water be liquid at a temperature where normally you wouldn't expect it we're talking minus 60 or minus 70 degrees centigrade so it's pretty chilly but you've got two things acting in your favor firstly you've got a kilometer and a half of ice weighing down on you which increases the pressure and that helps but you add to that the fact that there are lots of minerals on the surface of Mars, lots of salts, lots of things like perchlorates that can be dissolved into the water. And you know yourself, if you add salt to water, it lowers the melting point. 
according to the research in the paper, they discussed the possible chemicals that the water would have access to to soak out of the dust that falls on the ice cap, the stuff that's in the Martian surface. And they reckon it's fairly easy to suppress a melting point of water down to minus 60, minus 70, just with the material that's readily available without you having to stretch things too far beyond the realms of possibility, beyond the realms of feasibility. Right. And I guess the other reason that this is exciting is not so much the chance of life and all that, although that's very exciting. But if we were to send humans to Mars, if we were to colonize it, a ready available source of water, admittedly you've got to drill one and a half K down to get it. But that could be a huge advantage in terms of drinking water. You also get where there's water, there's oxygen and there's hydrogen. So there's potential fuel as well as um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, I know exciting a lot of people stuff. have been flagging that up, and I think that's almost a little bit of a misreading of it, if I'm honest. So one thing we do know about Mars is that it's actually a really wet planet. Everybody kind of assumes it's bone dry. It was warm and wet, and it had oceans in the past. Probably it had lakes, it had river systems. Now it's very cold and wet. And what I mean by that is that the atmosphere is super saturated with water. It holds exactly the maximum amount of water that could be there. It couldn't hold a drop more. And we do actually see water vapor clouds in Mars's atmosphere. It's just that the atmosphere is so cold and also so low density that all of the water it can hold isn't very much at all. All that water that was there making up the lakes and the rivers has moved into permafrost across the body of Mars. So there is a lot of water ice locked up in the surface, right in the surface layers all over the planet, but that's in the form of solid water. So I think if you go to Mars, you'd land somewhere in the lowlands in the northern hemisphere like all of the missions we've sent, and you'd use the locally available groundwater in the ice in the permafrost because you can just dig up a bit and melt it rather than having to go and drill on the South Pole. The other reason I'd say that partly is the polar caps themselves are pretty much all water ice. So there's a lot of water ice on top of the liquid water. But getting to the poles is a lot harder from a spacecraft point of view than getting to the equator. And getting to the South Pole is even harder than getting to the North Pole. Because not only do you have the difficulty of getting away from the equator, tilting your orbit to get way up top to come and land, the southern hemisphere of Mars is several kilometres higher than the northern hemisphere, which means the atmosphere is thinner and so therefore there's less to break you oh, when you're wow. coming into land. That's why we sent most of our missions to the northern hemisphere rather than the southern hemisphere, because the atmosphere is denser in the northern hemisphere, which makes landing slowing down that little bit more easy. Wow. that You are a wealth of information. I did not know that. I stand corrected on the, um, the atmospheric uh, water there. I was not aware that it was so saturated with water. That's incredible well, it's a really weird one I, i've mentioned this in outreach talks and stuff before and it's this kind of confu- it's a bit like saying that the universe is infinite and finite at the same time it's one of these things that takes you a little bit to get your head around because it's simultaneously there isn't much water in the atmosphere but it's saturated which means that the amount that there is is the maximum there possibly could be and i think that's the interesting fact but everybody imagines not much water they imagine like the sahara desert low relative humidity whatever whereas in fact there's as much water as you can cram into the atmosphere there. It's just there isn't much of it. Mm. It's sort of like how we talk about Antarctica as being the driest continent on the planet. Yes. I mean, it's it's full of frozen water, but it doesn't rain. Yeah. And yeah. I get you. Same kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, that is very, very cool. So I guess maybe we'll start targeting uh, that area for some more study uh, in future. That would be very cool. Find out it's how deep be it is. interesting. I mean, I think what's going to happen is they'll be continuing to take more and more and more data with this and obviously try and get the other dimensions, learn more. But I suspect all around the world there are people with a engineering bent, particularly those working for the space agencies like European Space Agency and NASA, are going to be thinking really hard about how you break those technological challenges, how you actually get over the hurdles that are involved in getting to the South Pole. Because wouldn't it be awesome if in a decade or two decades time, we have a way to actually get down, drill through the ice and see what's down there. And it's not beyond the bounds of possibility. It is fair to say that it would be hard and probably harder than anything else we've tried to do. But people have been thinking about how you get through the ice cap at the Jovian moon Europa Mm. to drill down into Europa's ocean. And that ice sheet's 10 kilometers thick, not one and a half kilometers thick. And it's even harder to land on Europe than it is to land on the Martian South Pole by an order of magnitude. So if people have been putting their ideas together for Europa's ocean, 
surely there are some gems in there that we can pull out and apply to Mars and maybe direct Mars 2030 to head to the polar cap, land there, drill down and just try and figure out what's happening. Very cool. Definitely one to watch. Okay, Sarah, let's turn to the world of microbiology now, which is a world of constant warfare. Animals and their immune cells in battle against viruses and bacteria. Bacteria fighting against other bacteria. Viruses and bacteria locked in mortal combat. And in that bacteria versus virus landscape, there's a bacterial defense mechanism we've talked a lot about before, CRISPR. We mainly talk about it as a technique for cutting and pasting gene sequences in animals, removing genetic diseases, giving people mutant superpowers, that sort of a thing. But CRISPR was originally, and still is, a defence mechanism for bacteria against viruses. It's a pretty good uh, defence mechanism, but it does have an Achilles heel that viruses can exploit, doesn't it? Yes, so... CRISPR, like a lot of technologies that we have, was found in nature. So basically every time a bacterial virus called a phage comes in and tries to invade a bacteria, if that bacteria then survives that attack, it takes little bits of the virus DNA and keeps them and sort of puts it into its own genome and stores it as a reference in case it ever gets attacked again. So we can have thousands and thousands of these if it's attacked by different viruses and they're all just there almost like mug shots so that whenever it encounters a similar virus again, it's got that information. So what it actually does is it uses that virus DNA to create guide RNAs, they're called. And these guide RNAs can join up with an enzyme called Cas9 that can then find matching DNA to that RNA. So if that virus then comes back, the guide RNA will find and bind up to that DNA that it matches with. And then the Cas9 enzyme basically chops up that DNA like a pair of molecular scissors. And that kills the virus because its DNA has been chopped up. So in this way, the virus, uh, so the bacteria has this advantage that it's seen these viruses before. And so it can launch this CRISPR defense mechanism to try and kill that virus before that virus can hijack the bacterial cell to replicate itself and destroy the bacteria. So it's evolved that to, to fight off infection by the virus. So it's like, I see the enemy and I know how to defeat this enemy. And before the enemy has a chance to invade, it's already wiped it out. Exactly. It's sort of like our, a different mechanism, but like our immune system. If we've come across a particular pathogen before, such as a virus, we can recognize it and we can uh, mount a more efficient immune response. So it's a little bit like that, just with a different mechanism. But of course, uh, viruses in particular, uh, they evolve very, very quickly. I mean, their generation time is incredibly short, just like bacteria. So together, they're going to be evolving not in isolation so there's this sort of evolutionary arms race that happens that as good as CRISPR gets in the bacteria the viruses get better and better at evading that and counteracting CRISPR so they actually have their own defense against the defense um, and they have these anti-CRISPR proteins that can bind to various aspects of the CRISPR or Cas machinery and stop it working but the problem is is that's quite slow so the bacteria have an advantage in that if they've seen this virus before, they can mount this CRISPR defense mechanism really quickly in actually about two minutes. So it's really, really fast. Two minutes is not long for the back, the uh, virus to come up with some anti-CRISPR proteins. Um, so in theory, you think, well, how can this actually work? How do these proteins work? And some researchers actually found that in fact, it doesn't work if you happen to be the first virus that attacks the bacteria or the second or the third or probably the, the thousandth. But what happens is if you are the first virus, you'll start producing a tiny bit of these anti-CRISPR proteins before the CRISPR wipes you out, but they stay there. So when the second virus comes along, there's a little bit of anti-CRISPR, they make a little bit more anti-CRISPR and so on. And eventually uh -huh. you get to this tipping point where there's enough anti-CRISPRs already there that that virus that comes along the thousandth or ten thousandth time, there's enough anti-CRISPRs already there to attack the CRISPR before the CRISPR can kill the virus. Wow. Um, so it just kind of bombards the bacteria with lots of viruses, well, individual strains of the virus, whatever. And 
each one makes a sacrifice like a kamikaze, but it makes a little bit of enough of that enzyme that the next one makes a bit more and it just piles up to destroy the bacteria. Wow. Exactly, which is strange because you think, well, why? Why would this have evolved? What, what's in it for that first uh, virus? Why would it attack when it's of no benefit to itself? But I mean, this is actually something in evolutionary biology called altruism, which is a little bit different from our everyday meaning of altruism because obviously viruses they're not even technically alive according to most people that they can't consciously decide I will sacrifice myself but they're still exhibiting this behavior Uh, and this uh, was actually the first documented case this study of a virus actually displaying altruism because it's well known in um, different organisms such as birds which could feed other individual birds and social insects like bees and ants where it's all for the good of the hive or the colony Um, but it had never been seen in viruses before I mean they're such simple things you wouldn't even say organisms because you know they're technically not even alive But interestingly, it's probably the same mechanism in that all these viruses that are attacking are actually clonal, so they're genetically identical. So even if you don't survive as a virus, if the thousandth or ten thousandth virus survives and propagates, that's still the same genetic material as you. So those genes that are promoting that altruistic behaviour are going to be propagated even if it's not you, it's a virus identical to you further down the line. So that's probably how it's evolved. Um, But it's really interesting to see that in a virus. So it's still kind of that selfish gene theory, whereas the genes are the same throughout all the viruses. So if a few organisms die, the other ones will live on. Very cool. Yeah, and it's still the same genes that you have, even if it hasn't come from you as the individual virus. Um, So it's really interesting. Uh, It's amazing that something like that can happen in something that's not even alive. Like it's, yeah, (laughs) evolution's incredible. (laughs) Yeah. um, I think it's interesting also because this is an article written by Ed Yong in The Atlantic, who we've raved about before. Uh, When this article was first published, I think it was uh, with the title, uh, How Viruses Cooperate to Defeat CRISPR. I'm not sure this is cooperation so much as self-sacrifice and bombardment and flooding. But Yes, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> cooperation doesn't seem to quite cover it. Um, but, yeah, viruses are amazing. I mean, that's why you d- humans don't take them lightly and, you know, viruses get the best of us a lot. So um, you don't underestimate viral evolution. And I mentioned earlier that CRISPR is now seen as an important tool for removing genetic diseases. Well, now Yale scientists have taken that a step further, and for the first time they've used CRISPR to correct a genetic disease in utero, so before the fetus was even born. Is that right? I just have to make one correction. In fact, they didn't use CRISPR, uh, but they used a different mechanism um, that isn't CRISPR. Uh, So this is sometimes the problem with scientific articles. They mentioned CRISPR at the top and then said people have used this technique, but actually it was something else. So did I when I first did it. I'd never actually heard of this new method, um, but it does the same thing as CRISPR. So CRISPR, as you would have talked about on the show, can be used to edit genes. So not just remove genes that aren't functioning properly. So a gene that might be defective and causing a disease in humans, for instance, but you can actually remove it and replace it with the gene with the correct sequence that you want. Mm -hmm. And this new technique that these researchers from Yale were doing was having the same effect but with a different mechanism. And they're saying that this mechanism is actually potentially safer than CRISPR because even though CRISPR is quite specific, occasionally you can be removing bits of DNA from the wrong place that you shouldn't be that could have really bad consequences depending on where it is. And they're saying that in this case, there might be lower potential for that. So what they use is they actually use something called PNAs, which I'd never heard of. So we've all heard of DNA and RNA, but apparently there is also PNA, Mm -hmm. which is peptide nucleic acid. So it's got the same bases that are in DNA and RNA, so your A's, G's, C's and T's, but the backbone is different. So it's actually a peptide-based Back, uh, backbone instead and they've actually artificially synthesized these and what they did is they injected some of this PNA along with 
donor DNA. So what the disease that they were looking at in this study, I should say, is beta thalassemia. So in beta thalassemia, people who suffer from this, there's a defect in the gene that codes for the protein, the beta protein, the beta globin in the hemoglobin. So this uh, is the wrong shape, the protein, so therefore the hemoglobin is the wrong shape. And because hemoglobin is going to be transporting oxygen in your red blood cells, it means these people are severely anemic because they can't transport enough oxygen around their body because their red blood cells are the wrong shape because the beta globin is the wrong shape. So what they want to do is get the correct sequence for the beta globin gene into uh, a mouse. But what's exciting about this study is it's not an adult mouse or even a baby mouse. It's a, a mouse that's still a fetus. So in utero, they want to be injecting this correct copy of the gene to see if they can cure these mice that have been genetically bred to be have beta thalassemia. So what they did is they got these PNAs and combined it with a DNA donor with the correct beta thalassemia gene sequence and they put that in a special nanoparticle because otherwise it's hard to get through into the cells and they injected it into the fetus in utero. And what happens is the PNA actually binds to the DNA. So they made a PNA that exactly was the right sequence that would target and bind to the defective copy of the beta thalassemia gene and it binds there and your body's natural DNA repair mechanisms come along and say, this looks a bit strange. What is this weird thing bound here? I'm going to get rid of it. And so they cut it out. And in so doing, they cut out the defective copy. And then the donor correct ah. copy is inserted in its place. So it's editing just like CRISPR. You get rid of a defective copy and put a new copy in, but it's just slightly a different mechanism. And you what the body to kind of do it for you. Yeah, the body's doing it for you, so which is another advantage of this because they're saying you're not putting some sort of outside enzyme that's going to cut up the DNA. It's just your body's own DNA recognizing that something is wrong and cutting out this PNA and the, the this PNA is quite targeted to that particular region that you want to cut out. So they're not saying that there's no potential for the PNA maybe to bind to the wrong spot and there to be issues. This is still early days, but it looks like there's potentially fewer of these off-target effects, they're called, than if you're using CRISPR. So amazingly, they found they just did this once. They just did one injection and they pretty much cured the beta thalassemia of these mice. So they actually found that in the bone marrow, 6% of the cells in the bone marrow had been successfully edited. Now, it doesn't, 6% doesn't sound like that much. That's like a, you could say it's a 94% fail rate. <laughs> but actually, if you look at it positively, that's all you need for this disease, beta thalassemia. As long as you have enough good copies of your beta globin protein to make hemoglobin, you can pretty much be in an undiseased state. So even though they only successfully edited 6%, and that was with only one injection, it was enough that these mice were born with uh, a normal increased, not quite normal, but increased hemoglobin concentration um, and they survived much better and they were, for all intents and purposes, cured. And so, and that's with one injection. So potentially in the future, this could be done with humans with beta thalassemia and other diseases. You could give more than one injection because they didn't find any negative si um, side effects to the injection process in this study. So it has massive clinical implications for a whole range of diseases, uh, just like CRISPR does. But this could just be another way of doing it. Because up until the development of these new technologies like CRISPR and this new PNA method, the uh, gene therapy was very crude. You would have to use a virus to try and insert uh, a good copy of a gene into your genome and that virus could insert anywhere it could insert in the middle of very very vital genes and and kill you so it could cure you but also kill you so there, there hasn't <laughs> been a way to do it safely yet and this and CRISPR could potentially be ways that this could be done in humans with with fewer side effects but of course that's always a possibility so there's still heaps mm. of research to be done but it's very exciting first steps at the moment it is that's huge and you know you kept saying this is one injection um how many do we know how many mice they were treating on this was this just one mouse got the injection and its babies were all okay no or? i i don't know the exact sample size okay. but i'm pretty sure they couldn't have got it published with one mouse <laughs> <laughs> well i just wanted to clarify but yeah 
Uh, I'm looking at the uh, original paper. Sorry, one now, injection per mouse. Yeah. I'm looking at the original paper now, and I'm understanding maybe one in five words, and that's not enough to tell me anything <laughs> about how many mouse they treated. <laughs> Uh, but it's exciting. That's very cool. I've never heard of that technique before. And uh, as, as I said, it, if it's using your body's own mechanisms in many ways, that's probably a lot safer than CRISPR and definitely a, an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, and, and we've all heard of CRISPR, but I hadn't heard of this at all. And there's probably all these new exciting methods that are coming out there that could do similar things. So hopefully at least one of them will work quite well in the future for humans. And how many other NAs are there? DNA, RNA, PNA, other well, uh, yeah, I think NAs? Yeah, <laughs> different kinds of RNAs. Like there's a gajillion different kinds of RNAs, but no, <laughs> PNA, I mean, that's exciting. Very exciting. Okay, now from the world of microbes to the world of adorably cute spiders. Now, anyone who knows me will probably be surprised to hear me call spiders cute, but I'm by no means talking about all of Satan's vicious eight-legged demon spawn because most of them are without doubt terrifyingly ugly. But peacock spiders, they're a bit different. They're tiny, like seriously tiny. And according to Dr. Jürgen Otto, a biologist who spent the last decade studying them, they're a lot like dogs and cats in that they have emotion. They show excitement and curiosity. They also have adorable courtship dances. You might have seen them on YouTube, probably dancing to Michael Jackson or Footloose or something. And Penny, Dr. Otto's just gone and discovered another species of peacock spider that he's dubbed Hokey Pokey, hasn't he? <laughs> well, two, two species. Two new species. So it's an interesting, yeah, I really like this. And I feel like Dr. Otto, like, really likes these spiders. So oh, not he just, does. He doesn't just um, compare them to yeah. dogs and cats, puppies and kittens. <laughs> He Next really level. likes them. Really, really I, I've read a few them. other articles about him. He's just slightly obsessed. I actually... Um, um, which is fine. I'd like to say as research for this, but really it was just my own personal journey. Spent a lot of time on his website, www.peacockspider.org. And it's just beautiful. They are beautiful spiders. He's got pictures of their babies or their second instar lava. And the photography is stunning. And they are really interesting looking spiders but this was interesting because um a while ago they saw the hokey pokey spider um 23 years ago and uh, somewhere in western australia near walpole but didn't collect a specimen and that's necessary for scientific classification to get it identified and published as a new species um so he went looking for the hokey hokey pokey spider in 2015 and was not even sure if he was in the right space the habitat seemed to have changed and they're sort of starting to think oh maybe you know we're not going to find this spider again so one last time they went out to where the spider had been seen and saw this is in 2017 2017 saw the peacock the hokey pokey spider, and saw another one as well. So the hokey pokey spider is Muratus tortoise, and tortoise um, is the Latin word for twisted to sort of do with its dance. But then another one as well, so Muratus unicup, and the Muratus unicup um, waves his arms as well when he's attracting a female in his particular courtship dance. And Unlike with some other spiders, uh, the dancers are usually successful and he has not once seen one of the females eat the males. So yay for those spiders exploring <laughs> egalitarian relations. <laughs> so wow. yeah, so I really liked reading about the discovery of the spiders. I also just really liked it because a lot of the quotes from Dr. Otto are just his, no, no, his interest in an affection for these it's spiders passion. and passion yeah and yeah. even like even though i'm always a bit sus about ascribing you know human emotions to mm -hmm. spiders or viruses you know um <laughs> yeah to, to to him these spiders seem affectionate and gentle and inquisitive and curious like their movements for whatever way and I think most people I mean they've become popular on you I can't imagine you know a series of 
YouTube videos about huntsmans, which I'm sure are their own beautiful, unique spiders, but mm. so popular. <laughs> <laughs> the way they move, <laughs> just, yeah. So I think there's something about these spiders that really resonates with us. They're certainly beautifully coloured. They behave in an interesting way and, yeah, just beautiful to look at. They're amazingly vibrant. I mean, the they photos are. that he's got of Maratus unicup, oh. it's got these gorgeous greeny blues mm. and oranges and whites. It's pretty impressive. And for something that's only a few millimetres long as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very, very cool. Um, and, yeah, definitely check out uh, peacockspider.org mm. for all sorts of cool photos, including one of his finger with a baby uh, peacock spider on it that is literally only a millimetre or so oh, it's long. Tough. It's Yeah. I think that's our show. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 305. Don't forget you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate pledging to support us on Patreon, or just get the word out there. Tell your friends, post on social media. Uh, longtime supporter Ryan James, who's been tweeting about us consistently for a while. He's often posting stories that we talk about or a little quote he liked. So thanks very much for that, Ryan. We're really glad you liked the show. Professor Jonty Horner, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you ever so much. Where can people find you on the internet? Find me on Twitter at at John T. Horner. Find my articles at The Conversation. And for those of your listeners who don't go to The Conversation regularly, really recommend people check it out for free science and research news. I think it's a great, awesome place. And I could talk about that for hours myself. <laughs> and I do have my own website as well at johntehorner.com, but that's really in need of updating. <laughs> very good. And Sarah DeGarris, we're very grateful you could join us today as well. No problem. And thank you once again, Penny. Thanks, Ed. And a big thank you to everyone for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. It's pretty cool. So we've been on Facebook Live today, and we've been getting some questions from people about where they can see it. That is probably the most common question that we've been getting today. So can you kind of explain why we can't see it here in the U.S. if we were to walk out right now outside this building? Well, the easiest explanation is when you walk outside, you look up, the moon's not there. That's we, true. We, <laughs> we live on a round planet, right, Good everybody? Point, Jackie. The Earth is round. <laughs> Let's just get an applause for that. Yes, thank you. Yes! Not that is flat. Some people still don't believe you. It's a very interesting thing where it seems to have reemerged this idea that we do not live on this beautifully round planet. Uh, and so the, the fact that it's round means you're going to be on one side or the other. And right now the sun is shining on us. And so you can just, if the lunar, if we're watching a video cast right now of a red, beautifully eclipsed moon, it means that the other side of the earth. So we're not going to have enough time to turn because we are a turning round ball. We won't have enough time to turn and face the moon before the moon passes out of the Earth's shadow. So, now, lunar sad. eclipses, yeah, I know. Next time, though, I think there's one next year on January 21st, which happens to be my birthday. Oh, look at so, you. So, yeah, we're going to have a moon party next year. So. That's great.